It's a homework for today. Get all the get all the answers. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Get something close to what the answers, the given answers were. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that last problem. The wording was, uh, I, I don't know what happened. I must have, uh, what I was doing, I, I left out stuff. But yeah, it was, uh, you needed flow rate, right? Or you couldn't do it. So the three, what was flow rate? 30,000? 30,000 30, per hour? Or pound mass per hour? 30,000 pound mass per hour. Yeah, you needed a flow rate for that one uh, in order to, to get the rate of uh, energy, uh, energy flow. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so um, I'll collect your, your work before you leave. And I, I have some, uh, some problems for us to do as well. And I want to do, um, I'd like for you to do a problem that's similar to the homework, but we're going to use that as a segue to a refrigeration problem. And uh, this is an interesting scenario. Um, it, it, it's actually a, 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 an automobile air conditioning system. So we're going to start by doing the, uh, the psychometric analysis of uh, the simple system in that we're just taking outdoor air directly uh, and conditioning it. So it's coming in at like 95 degrees, and, and we're conditioning it down to 75 degrees. And uh, typical car air conditioners run around 300 CFM plus or minus, so they're they're low flow, uh, uh, but they can be uh, quite quite effective. And uh, there, there's a, a little I mean, car car air conditioners are kind of a science in and of themselves. Uh, they're quite different, as you can might imagine, from a building uh, air conditioning system in that the components are spread out in the uh, in the engine. And uh, there's like a little radiator that uh, helps to, uh, you still have the, the, the basic parts of the vapor compression cycle are present, they're just distributed differently, packaged differently uh, to take uh, into consideration the environment of the automobile. Um, they also have to operate in the extreme conditions that buildings don't often have to, to deal with, as you might imagine. Um, and uh, so this is a little car air conditioning problem. Uh, car air conditioners were, uh, are really at the forefront of technological change in refrigerants as well because uh, you know, many car, uh, cars have traditionally run on R134A, which is the one we do in thermo class, but uh, uh, we're really trying to get away from R134A because it's a, green, it's a powerful greenhouse gas, a thousand times more potent than the CO2, um, and, uh, and cars are, are, and, and vehicles are really commanding attention because uh, those systems are most prone to lose coolant. The refrigerant can leak out, whereas very, very little refrigerant escapes from buildings. Those systems are pretty robust in terms of keeping the refrigerant in great care is taken. In fact, the building codes are very severe in, uh, 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 in making sure that refrigerant stays in the system. But cars and vehicles are a very different thing. Uh, Sometimes you know you have to replace your refrigerant in your vehicle. You know, accidents and things result in the loss of refrigerant. So there's a shift to really pushing cars toward uh, refrigerants that are have, have little or no greenhouse gas uh, greenhouse effect. So uh, carbon dioxide is one refrigerant that's being looked at. Of course, it's a greenhouse gas, but compared with other refrigerants, it, it has minimal impact. Um, and there's another one that's being looked at is our one, two, three, four, YF. And that's the refrigerant we're gonna be looking at in this example. So I'll go ahead and pass, uh, pass this out. And uh, you will need your, 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 uh, your chart, your psychometric chart, and I have some extra ones. The other really interesting area of uh, HVAC that's quite different from buildings is uh, commercial airplanes. And if anyone is interested, I think maybe you, some of you might have even done a little project in the heat, in, uh, heat transfer, where you did a heat transfer analysis of an airplane. And uh, but that's another really, it's a niche area in HVAC, but uh, it's an area where you know, if you want to work at Boeing or an aircraft company, um, there's a lot of work going into uh, 
uh, aircraft HVAC, as you can imagine, because of COVID, you know, looking for ways to, uh, uh, to, to, to filter air, to deal with contaminants. Uh, and, and believe it or not, uh, commercial aircraft systems are, are, are pretty good in terms of uh, filtering the air and zoning it so that uh, people are exposed to minimal air from, uh, from neighboring people. Um, and uh, that was good even at the beginning of COVID and improvements have been made to, uh, so right, you know, getting on an airplane, you might think you're really exposing yourself to a lot of uh, other people's uh, germs, but in fact, the HVAC systems are, are quite good at, uh, uh, at, 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 at pulling air out. They have almost a you know, very high ventilation rate um, that comes in. Almost all of the air is exhausted rather than returning it, and uh, they're pretty, pretty, uh, pretty safe. I'm sorry, Christian, you had your hand up. Oh, and I'm, yeah. yeah, I did want to ask, uh, before R134A, yeah. was the main refrigerant R4? Well, it's R22. I'm trying um, to remember what big, it was. Yeah, big systems and R12. <laughs> R12 was really, that was like magic. <laughs> you know, that was the refrigerant. Uh, R20, R12 was used uh, not just as a refrigerant, but as a propellant. You know, like, uh, I don't know if you, you're probably too young to remember, but when I was a teenager, uh, really into my 20s, um, deodorants were all spray, you know, hairspray, and, and there's all this stuff that you sprayed, uh, cleansers and uh, things like that. And, and R12 was used as a, uh, as a propellant to help to atomize stuff and spray it. And of course, it turned out R12 is. These are uh, CFCs, uh, chlor chloro chlorocarbons. They have chlorine uh, in them, and so when you get uh, a, a chlorine, uh, a chlorinated uh, compound in the atmosphere, um, and it it it, uh, it receives uh, solar radiation. The solar radiation causes a, a chemical reaction, a photochemical reaction that. that breaks off the chlorine, and it's a chlorine radical, and that's a highly, highly reactive species, and it, uh, it, it reacts with ozone, O3, and it splits the O3 up, and you, you know, destroy the ozone in the atmosphere. And uh, that led to the creation of these ozone poles you may have heard of back in the 80s and 90s, and it was pretty scary, because ozone is what protects us from ultraviolet radiation. And, uh, and this led to the, uh, uh, the, Mont uh, what was it? the uh, Montreal Accords, I think they're called, 1987, where you know, most of the world's countries agreed to phase out CFCs. And it's one of the great successes and one of the few successes of international negotiation leading to you know, a binding agreement that our, everybody agreed to. Um, developing countries were given time a little bit of time to uh, 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 phase out these refrigerants, but um, by and large, we've gotten rid of CFCs. I, I don't think you can find them anywhere now. And in fact, uh, HCFCs, uh, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, um, were also phased out, but you can still find those around. Um, I think you can still, mm, boy, you may still be able to get those as replacements for existing, for legacy systems, but you can't get, you can't get them new. Um, so that would be R22. R22 is also very good. But losing R12, that, that was a big blow to the HVAC industry because R12 was such a good refrigerant. You had very efficient and high, high COP um, systems. And uh, then we got rid of R22 and we were left with R134A and R410 is the workhorse for household systems. But R410 is gonna have to go away because it too is a powerful greenhouse gas. And that was, the R410 was the last really good one left. And now it's, it's becoming harder to find refrigerants that, are, that have good thermo properties, but also are, are harmless for the environment and harmless to people. Um, so the race is on to find the replacements for R134A and R410. But R1234YF is, is one and uh, we are even going back to the future, sort of, going back to the first refrigerants, which were natural refrigerants, so ammonia 
is coming back. Ammonia is a very effective refrigerant. It doesn't do anything harmful, harmful to the environment, but it is bad for people. And if ammonia leaks out of your system, the people in the vicinity are, are going to be threatened by that, and the animals as well. So safe, you have to take special safeguards uh, for ammonia. Propane is another very effective refrigerant. Uh, doesn't do any harm when it gets out into the environment, but it's flammable. So there you've got a flammability problem. We use propane in our stoves, and uh, you don't want your refrigerators blowing up or your, your HVAC. Um, so there's a, there are problems, there's trade-offs, but you really the big three, you need, you need thermodynamic performance. It has to, th the refrigerant has to evaporate and condense at the right temperatures to cool. It has to be non-toxic and it has to be environmentally friendly. And it's very hard and non-flammable. So thermodynamically effective, non-flammable, non-toxic, and environmentally benign. That's a, that's a lot to ask for in one chemical. So there's a whole branch of HVAC that is uh, developing, trying to develop refrigerants. And that's another area of employment where you can probably find positions now. There's a lot of work that's being done to and a lot of it's proprietary too. That's another problem is uh, each major equipment maker is, has its own research programs. And uh, so there's uh, the problem of um, you know, trade secrecy and you know, not sharing of information. It's kind of a, that's a tough area. Anyway, I'll let, let you all work on your own. Anybody need a psycho, psycho, psycho charts? Psycho, psycho metric. Uh, psycho. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, we can't work on one. Yeah. Uh, starting to run out here. Yes, sir. We can both work on one. Oh, okay. Is that one, have you written anything on it yet? No. No, okay. I guess when we're done, we'll just take a, take a photo of it or something. Yeah, yeah sounds good. I'm trying to figure out... Uh, how to do the part for the oil bypass factor. Oh, no, 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 we are given. We are given information. We're given. Okay, never mind. For some reason, I thought we weren't. I thought we weren't given the flow that we weren't given the flow rate that we are. Okay, so we'll have to calculate the we'll have to calculate the uh, yeah we'll have to calculate the yeah we'll need the specific volume. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay though. Yeah. So the chart is. I should go. I can go get my my small ruler. And then 75 is wet hole. So we're looking yeah, for the intersection of this. What's going to be right here? Oh. Uh, or there about, and we need the specific volume. Yeah, yeah, it's not But now it's been just turned in more. I would say 14.32. Yeah, I mean, it's not that bad. 
I'll read that down. I guess we can just get the properties in case we need more. I don't know what other properties we're going to need. Well, we should get the whole thing. Yeah. And then we can think what we need. Yeah. yeah. So, what's the output being you got? Uh, I only, so far, I just got the specific volume so far. Uh, you get 22.56? Uh, I got the specific volume 14.32. Yeah, we can. It's up to you what you want. Which one do you want to do next? Uh, I guess we can do humidity ratio. Um, that is. That looks like it's going to be a hundred. Oh, did I? It's going to be a hundred and seven grains. So we're going to try to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's the temperature coming out of the conditioner, which is also the supply. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the reason it's different is because sometimes there's, a, there's a other things between the conditioner and the supply. Yeah. 14.32. And then this one is, in this case, TC and TS are the same. 97 grains. And then we have to do that. Oh, okay, so uh, a couple of things. You, you see the uh, temperatures given as uh, uh, 95, 75. That, this is a, kind of the conventional way of uh, writing dry bulb and wet bulb together without saying, you know, writing out in full dry bulb, wet bulb. So the first number is dry bulb. And the second number is the wet bulb. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Also, in this problem, the uh, TC and the and TS are the same. Oh. Because. Uh, the air leaving the coil is going into the room. So the coil temperature, these two temperatures are the same. And then we have to find entropy. We don't need to find dew point, do we? This one's always difficult because my ruler is not It's not long enough to go across. So that would be 36, 37, 38, 38.4, somewhere around there, 38.4. Yeah, I'll draw it to make sure, but I think it's about 38.4. Is this 36, 37, 38.4, somewhere around there. Yeah. Okay. Is that all we need at that point? I mean, the only other thing we could get would be the dry bulb. Yep. I mean, excuse me, the dry bulb, the dew point temperature. But I don't think we need the dew point temperature.
Let's see if I can get this first. I got uh, I got 95. That's fair. Oh, I wrote zero. Oh, right. I wrote 97. It's 90, 90, 94, yeah, 97. Is yeah. Oh, yeah, because each increment is three. Yeah, it's two. Yes. That's not right. I did this. It's not right. Not right. How much is there on the air? So it should be how much is on the air? I think that's it for that part. And our return is at... Nope, I did the first part wrong. I did the so we still need to solve for TS, correct? Mm -hmm. We don't have the... So we need to find. Oh. Uh, yeah. Use it with the equation of the other. Uh, yes. Anybody get a number for uh, the sensible heat? Yes, sir. Yeah. Or is that relative to the level temperature as well? Just keep just temperature, which is uh, 90. So, what, what did you do for 90? 98? Uh, 95. 95. No, no, don't worry. It's okay. It's kind of just going to break it down. Right, right. I can do it. So, the PC is 47. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at this. This is actually, we're coming at the HVAC design from the opposite side. Last, last time we were looking at the space and we were designing our system given the space load, you know, the heat transfer analysis on the room. So we had a sensible heat load and a latent heat load for the room. Now we're coming at it from the equipment side because there's also, for the equipment, there's a sensible heat. We call that the equipment sensible heat capacity and the equipment latent heat capacity. Because we have to choose equipment that has a capacity that matches our space load. Um, and uh, so we, we look at it from coming at it from the equipment side. This is where the uh, apparatus dew point 
and the, uh, the bypass factor are used because these are equipment uh, specs that we get from the manufacturer. Let's see if we can get it to display here. This is our, our incoming air, right? We've got outside air at 95 and 75, okay? And, uh, and, we, and it's coming in at 300 CFM. And we're given the apparatus dew point. Now, what do we do with the apparatus dew point? We plot it. So we come over here and we go all the way out. The apparatus dew point is the temperature on the coil when the, when, the, when the cooling coil is operating as it's designed to operate. This is the temperature on the surface of that coil. You know, you've got cold refrigerant going through there. Refrigerant's probably 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's transferring, uh, heat is transferring from outside the cooling tubes to in, inside the coil. But on the outside surface, this uh, apparatus dew point, that's the temperature on the outside surface of the coil. So if I, as the designer of the HVAC system, if I know what that apparatus dew point temperature is, I can draw a line from the in inlet air, the air going into the conditioning unit, just draw it all the way out until it's at 35 degrees and on the saturation line uh, because this is going to be, uh, the, the, the water is going to be condensing. It's going to be well below the dew point temperature of, of any air that I'm going to put in. So we're going to be on the saturation line. And, uh, and this is what the air, th this is going to be the condition of the air right on the surface of the coil tubes on the, on the the tubes. And as you move out from the tubes, the air is going to get a little warmer and less and less humid. Um, dropping below 100% uh, relative humidity. So that's the apparatus dew point temperature. The bypass factor then tells us where on this operating line, this is our operating line here, where on this line will uh, my air actually be? And we can find that out by uh, 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 from this, this equation here, um, if the spec says the bypass factor is 0.2, and we know the, uh, the temperature uh, going in, <coughs> do we have the... Uh, So this is the outside air that's going in. We can solve for the air coming off, the, the, the dry bulb temperature of the air coming out of our unit is going to be what, Tc equals uh, T ADP plus the bypass factor is the air going in minus the apparatus dew point temperature. Do, uh, apparatus dew point, right? Or 35 degrees plus the bypass factor is 0 0.2, the air, the air going in is at 95 degrees minus 35, or what did you get? 47. 47, 47 degrees. So this is going to be the state of the air coming out of the unit given that the air in contact, direct contact with the coils at 35 degrees. So now I come over here and 
I look for, uh, actually I already did it, right here, 47 degrees, 45, 46, 47, and then I draw you know, a line up, and I see where it intersects that operating line between the outside air temperature going in and the apparatus dew point. And that's gonna represent the supply air coming out. Okay? Yeah. Now, I better hope that this, uh, this supply air point is on the sensible heat, the space sensible heat line with the, the uh, air in the compartment of the car. And uh, I didn't give you that, uh, those properties of the, uh, for the uh, air inside the passenger compartment, but I'm just uh, plugging, you know, assuming 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity is what we want inside our car. So what that means is that um, if in fact that's what, the, that's what the state is inside the car, then the specific heat, the space sensible heat ratio is gonna be the slope of this line here. So I would, I would draw that line up, right? And then I want to know what, what is my space sensible heat load. And I would shift that up until it goes through that little point there. And then this would be my space sensible heat. Sensible heat ratio of my space is about 0.67. Okay? But my equipment sensible heat ratio is going to be governed by this line here. So that's, that's my equipment. And to figure that out, we have to, uh, we have to calculate what the sensible and latent heat capacity is for the equipment. Yes, sir? So if the compartment for the room temperature is a given is 75 and 50, we should just assume? Um, you, you, you can. It's a, it's a common design set point. Okay. Yeah, but it wasn't required for this problem. You, you didn't really need that because I didn't ask for the space sensible heat. Rather, your, your, your calculation is based on the, the line from 1 to 1 to 2. I just drew the point 3 out there to illustrate. Um, whereas in our, in our homework, and last time we were coming at it from the perspective of the space, now we're coming at it from the perspective of the equipment, what the equipment is doing. Um, so we want to calculate the specific, the sensible heat ratio of the equipment. That's our space sensible heat. This must be less than or equal to at all times. They could be less than. Uh, you don't want this number to be greater than the sensible heat ratio for the space, when that happens, you can't dehumidify. You're gonna, your air is going to be more humid than, uh, than, than what your design state would be. But as long as you're at or below the space sensible heat ratio, the equipment should work if, if it's the control systems are properly designed. So what is the sensible heat ratio of our equipment? Well, it's going to be yes. <laughs> sensible heat ratio of the equipment is equal to the sensible heat over the total heat, where the sensible heat is and I, I'm going to use the numbers here just to be clear. So we're going in at T1 and coming out at T2, right? And then there's the quick and dirty uh, way to do it, where you don't even have to worry about the mass flow rate of the air. You just use, uh, a, you know, it's approximately equal to 1.1 T1 minus T2 times the, uh, volume, the volume flow, right? Okay, this is a constant problem and it's a big headache because HVAC engineers love to use this. It's very simple. You don't need the psychometric chart. It's a quick way to find out what your flows or your sensible heat ratio is. Um, the problem is, this is assuming standard air. It's assuming that the air is at 68 degrees. 
If you're dealing with air that's at 95 degrees, this is going to be quite a bit off. In fact, I, I did it this way, it's about 10%, a 10% error if I use this. So I would advise against using the quick and dirty formulas. I put them out there because uh, all HVAC engineers use them and you'll probably want to use them at some point, especially when you're dealing with near room temperature air. But as you get far away from standard conditions, this becomes a problem. And one of the reasons I don't like it is because I know for a fact that on the PE exam, they will give you a problem. <laughs> They'll give you a problem uh, where you have to use this formula to get the right answer. One of the answers will be obtained using this and it'll be wrong. <laughs> so I learned the hard way on that. Um, so I, I try to use this one mo most of the time. So you'll see in homework solutions and things like that, I'll almost always use this one. Um, but it does require that you have um, uh, the psychometric chart because you need MA and MA, the air going in is going to be equal to Q over specific volume. Over the specific volume, right? So I've got to use the chart to get the specific volume. So I have to come over here. And that's why I drew the little blue line here. What's the specific volume there? 14.32 there. 14. It's about 14.31. Is that that would be 14.35 there? So about 14.31 cubic feet per pound of dry air. 14.3, 14.31, whereas it's 13.33 for standard air. Okay? So uh, if we plug in then our, uh, what is it, 300 CFM? Yes. And uh, 14.31 cubic feet per pound of dry air. So that's going to be dry air per minute, and we convert to hour, so 60 minutes per hour is going to give us 20. I don't understand this. I can't. I. I um. My heat transfer class calculations, and I can't find my. Uh, Um, 14. Oh, just a little bit less. It's a little bit less. Oh, 1,259. Is that what you get? Yeah, 58. Yeah. Oh, okay. Five eight, five nine. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's close enough. Right. Okay. So then our QS is one two five nine um, pounds of dry air per hour times point two four zero. And then T1 minus, and this 2.240, this is specific heat of dry air. So the units are BTU per pound degree F. And then we multiply by the temperature difference, 95 minus 47, right? Is that right? And this should give us 14,000, about 14,500. I get 504, but um, most people would convert that to zeros on the end. This, 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 this is so uncertain, this four, that uh, just rounding it would be fine. Our design. Did, did you all get that? You see how we got that? It's a very okay. close, yeah. Something close, good. And then uh, similarly for the latent heat, the latent heat uh, calculation is uh, T 
1076. Times the mass flow of dry air times the difference in the humidity ratio. So the humidity ratio of 1 minus the humidity ratio of 2, right? So again, you have to use the chart here. Um, and it's like 42. It's like 42 divided by 7, or close, 42, 43 divided by 7. So that I, I, I have point zero one four one. It looks like it's uh, it's about 99. It's 99 divided by 7,000, 0.0141. Yeah, yeah. So it's about 99 grains. Is that okay? And then uh, over here. Oh, I drew it at 96. Yeah. That's the history here. Uh, I, I think I'm going to need this. That's, good. That's a hard one to. Yeah, you sure I so I'll fix that. I see what I did now. Give me a second, sorry. That makes more sense. About 43. Point oh oh six one. Point oh oh six one. Right? So we plug those in. So 1076 okay. times the mass flow rate of dry air was 1259 or 1258. And then the difference in the humidity ratio, this is our moisture removal, is 0 0.0141 minus 0 0.0061. Uh, which gives us uh, 10837. So there's my latent, and there's my sensible. Right? Which means my ratio is Q sensible is 14504. BTU per hour divided by 14504 plus 10,837 equals 0.57. OK? So we would say that's our equipment sensible heat ratio. And it needs to be less than the sensible heat load on our space that we're cooling in order for us to be able to meet both our dry bulb and, uh, and our humidity goals or design goals, okay? So this is another way of working at the psychrometric analysis. We can start with the equipment and work backward toward the space. We start at the space and work toward the equipment. At some point we have to deal with both, of course, because we have to choose the equipment we are needing. But in order to go to the next stage of our analysis, we need the total 14504 plus 10837 equals, what was the total? Um, 25341. UTU per hour, which is about 2.1 tons. Okay? So now, as the designer of the refrigeration system, well, look, in the vast majority of cases, as, as an HVAC engineer, you're just going to call, you know, you're going to call the HVAC supplier, Daikin or Mitsubishi, and they're going to sell you the whole package. You're, you don't even have to deal with the refrigeration because the supplier will handle that for you. You'll get a nice package. 
the refrigeration system will be built to you know, drive the HVAC system. But it is good to know how refrigeration works and how to do design calculations. And who knows, you might even work be the engineer that designs the refrigeration part. And that's what we're going to get to next is, OK, uh, I need 25,341 BT per hour of cooling for my car air conditioner. How do I deliver that? And that's what we'll look at next here. In fact, that's what notes uh, five, right? Notes four, refrigeration, really is all about. It's, it's, a, it's probably most of it is a review because we do cover that in the thermo class. But what is probably new with, is using the pH diagram. Uh, did I pass those out? The, oh, here. Give you some uh, pH diagrams to play with. Yeah, yeah, so it's awful. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, so you, you all have the, uh, the diagrams there. Um, Okay, let's just uh, say something a little bit about refrigeration here uh, before we attack this uh, part of the problem. Remember from thermo, refrigeration systems are systems that move heat uphill, right? These are, in heat pumps, I like the word heat pump because it, it really gives you a, a, an image of what's going on. You're pumping heat from somewhere where it, it, it wants to be to where it doesn't want to be, and that takes energy, so you have to put work in to drive energy from a cold, cool space to a warmer space. And then the uh, device that does that uh, can be configured in a number of different ways, with the vapor compression cycle being by far the most, uh, the most common. The coefficient of performance is the measure of the efficiency of the refrigeration process. This is how much cooling you get per unit of work you put in. So the Remember, efficiencies are measures of good stuff out over bad, you know, what you have to pay to get the good stuff, right? So you gotta put energy in to get what you want, cooling, and if it's a heat pump and you're using it as a heater, we just use the QH, because uh, in the case of a heat pump in heating mode, we want heat. So that goes in the numerator, but if it's a heat pump or an air conditioner in cooling mode, we want QL, so we put QL in the, in the numerator there. And that is how we can calculate the COP. And in our case, uh, that total cooling load that we just calculated, um, what was it, 14,000? Uh, 25,341, 25,341 BTU per hour in HVAC lingo is Q, little QT, but in our thermodynamics uh, terminology, it's Q dot, big Q dot L, okay? So it's this, this part here, and um, if we look at vapor compression, uh, this is, you know, you open up the black box in the middle of that diagram we just saw, and this is what it looks like. This is the cooling coil. We call it, well, it's an evaporator, but in HVAC, we often refer to it as the cooling coil. Um, if we're using a heat pump for heating, um, well, then the condenser will be uh, the source of our heat. So this would be the heating coil in winter, cooling coil in summer. And uh, so we've got to have our refrigerant entering as liquid or liquid vapor mixture, and then it evaporates at constant temperature and constant pressure. It's drawing the heat out of the space, and it's becoming latent heat in the refrigerant, putting it into the vapor phase. So we come out here where we're all vapor. And then we compress that vapor until it's a, a hot, high pressure, hot vapor, and then condense it, and the condensing part is important because this is where we get rid of the energy that we picked up here. We get rid of by pushing it outdoors, or if it's a refrigerator, it just goes into our room. So a refrigerator in our building acts like a, a heater when it's operating because it's pushing the, the energy that it's removing from the cold space, plus whatever is going in as work here that sum comes out into the environment. Um, and then the opposite, you know, what we're doing here is we're condensing that vapor into a liquid. So we go in as, actually come out as a superheated vapor, and then we, de we de-superheat, we have to cool to the saturation point, and then condense at constant temperature and pressure to a condensed liquid, 
Or in a real system, this would be a subcooled liquid. And in a real system, this would be superheated into vapor, slightly superheated here. Uh, and then we take this liquid and expand it, flash it through a throttling device that drops the pressure. And we do that, we just kind of block the flow. It's like an obstruction, a controlled obstruction in the path of the refrigerant, so the refrigerant backs up. You create a little traffic jam of refrigerant molecules, so high pressure where the molecules are backing up, and then you're just letting a little bit of through at a time here, so the pressure drops down low, and that, uh, that drop in pressure causes a good chunk of this liquid to vaporize. So you have a... Generally, a, a, about 30% vapor here. I mean, ideally, you'd want pure liquid. You'd like to have just a cold liquid here because that would give you a maximum potential for absorbing heat if you have all liquid going in, but the reality is this is only going to be about 30%, this is going to be about 70% liquid, 60 to 70% liquid, and then it'll all go to vapor through the evaporator, okay? And then on the TS diagram, which is how we represent it in the thermoclass, it looks like this. There you see the uh, starting out, ideally it's saturated vapor, and then it's superheated, and we do an isentropic compression, it's straight up, uh, 0.2, superheated, we desuperheat, bringing the temperature down to saturation, and then condensing, and then we drop it. This is a constant enthalpy process, but it's, it, the, in, the entropy increases uh, because we're, we're converting from uh, liquid to vapor, and a vapor has higher entropy than liquid, the liquid state, and then process repeats, okay? And then we do the energy balance around the different points, um, M dot being the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. So that would be the ideal. Uh, and then th this process is called the refrigeration effect. Sometimes you'll hear that and see that in HVAC uh, talk. Um, and then if we look at how this uh, cycle would be represented in real equipment, um, I just replaced my refrigerator. Um, I had a really old refrigerator. It had the condenser coils on the back. You can see them and feel them. Now it's all built in, my new one. Um, but the, uh, the evaporator is, of course, inside the, uh, the freezer in most cases. And then you'll, you'll push residual heat down into the refrigerator area, but you're mainly cooling the, refriger uh, the freezer part and uh, then the compressor here, uh, the condenser coils, and then the little capillary tube used for expansion. Yes? I did want to ask for the condenser coils. Is there any advantage to having it inside versus outside of the unit? Because if it's on the outside, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be more efficient to transfer heat to the surrounding? That makes sense. Yes, but the modern ones now have, <coughs> Do they have, have like fans, a they have a little fan or something that helps to oh, okay. to enhance the to bring out the, the heat. Um, if it's inside, would it heat the area around it a little bit more? Inside the or is it, in a, is it in a separate compartment? Yeah, it's it's insulated. Okay. Uh, okay. There's Thank heavy you. insulation protecting it. And now the, the modern refrigerators use uh, variable speed drives on the compressor, which older ones didn't have, so they would just switch on. They were either on or off. But modern refrigerators now, this can run at variable speed, which just saves energy. And it also makes the makes it last longer. Although mine lasted, gosh, 20, 26, 26 years I got out of my old Frigidaire. I don't think I'll be around long enough to see how much, how long I'll get out of, uh, well, not here at least, but 25 years from now, I'll be greedy. I'm already like that now. Okay, uh, so compressor designs, um, different kinds of compressors, so small refrigeration systems and small air conditioners will typically have a hermetically sealed, uh, like a big cylinder, just 
and it's very hard to break open. If you ever tried to open this up, it's really hard. It takes pretty big tools and hammers. And, um, but you find a little piston in there. So there's a motor, uh, plug it in, and the, the motor is uh, has a little shaft that's connected to the, the piston rod here, and it's just like a piston cylinder. Back and forth, and that's pushing the refrigerant through. And uh, on bigger systems uh, and bigger air conditioning systems and big freezers and things, you might find a scroll compressor, which is not a piston, but it's uh, like a screw that uh, it, you really have to see. Uh, you have to you have to see this from the uh, upper up down's perspective. How a scroll compressor works? They're really cool. It has this um, rotating. Good grief! I mean, it looks like a shell a seashell of some kind, but it sucks in the refrigerant uh, uh, in, in, a, in a space where the, 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 the volume is relatively large, the surface area, or the, the uh, cross-sectional area is relatively large, and then as this, this thing turns, the refrigerant gets pushed into a, a narrower and narrower passageway until in the middle, it's, there's hardly any space for it. So it, 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 you have really high pressure here at the center, and then you discharge it um, into the uh, into the condenser. So you would use these on larger systems, and then a screw compressor would be an even larger system where you just have these rotating uh, like gears, and you're pushing the, uh, the refrigerant is getting squeezed through and uh, reducing the specific volume as you go along. And then to the big stuff, the big centrifugal compressors. Now these are going to be on big chilled water systems, and uh, the, the uh, centrifugal pumps and compressors operate the same principle. The uh, fluid goes in uh, in, the, in the, the center, in the center, and then it gets turned 90 degrees, um, and then through centrifugal force, and then it gets accelerated out to the discharge. Usually it's, uh, well, it's collected and, and pushed out. So that would be for big, uh, for big systems. And then the, uh, these little, the throttling, what we see in our thermo class is a little X or a little circle for a throttling valve. These are interesting little devices. You might wonder, well, how does this work? How does throttling work? This is really the key part of a refrigeration cycle. And uh, this is a common type that's used. And uh, so the refrigerant's coming in here, high pressure, it's coming out here at low pressure. And what's happening? Well, you've got this controlled precisely by um, a signal that comes from the exit of the evaporator. Okay? So the, the flow here is keying off the temperature of the refrigerant leaving the evaporator. So let's say this thing's operating, and suddenly there's a big, heavy cooling load, right? You open your freezer and you just hold it open. Uh, so now this thing's going to be working hard. Need more refrigerant, need more refrigerant, you need more cooling. Well, what's going to happen is um, with that sudden increase in load, the refrigerant leaving the refrigerator, the temperature is going to go up. That's going to get hot. You're going to have to push more refrigerant through to cool it down. Well, you've got a little bulb here, and it actually uh, is attached to the evaporator exit. This is the exit of the evaporator. This little bulb is filled with a gas, and as the temperature leaving the evaporator increases, the gas expands. And as the gas here expands, that it pushes on the gas at the other end of the tube, where the gas is pushing on a diaphragm, and that pushes, that the force is transmitted to the spring, and uh, the result is this plunger comes down and it opens this valve further. It makes this opening bigger and allows more refrigerant to come through. Uh, and then when you know, the evaporator says, all right, I'm, I'm cool, then the gas cools, and this comes back up and closes a little bit. So this thing's always going up and down, up and down, up and down, as the cooling load is going up and down. And a uh, really cool little device it's called thermostatic expansion valve. Um, then the evaporator coil uh, and the condenser coil looks uh, similar, except the difference is the evaporator coil, uh, on an air conditioning system at least, is going to, uh, you've got a place where you collect the condensate, is it like a pan, um, and then there's a, uh, um, a little thing here to keep air. You don't want air coming, coming, coming out, so this little trap here keeps 
prevents air from coming in, and you collect the condensate to do, do whatever with it. Uh, but you see these are the tubes, the refrigerant tubes, lots of little tubes, so you want lots of surface area for the cold refrigerant to contact the warm air coming in. Now if this was a chiller, you would have cold water in these tubes rather than refrigerant, but assuming now this is a refrigerant coil, we call those uh, DX coils because it's a direct refrigerant to air. Um, so not only do you have lots of tubes, coiled tubes, but you have lots of fins for heat transfer. And those fins, of course, give you more surface area to enhance the transfer of energy from the air into the tubes. So when we say that you know, the apparatus dew point temperature, that's the temperature right on the surface of these tubes. Okay, and then as this air comes in, of course, only some of that air, only a tiny fraction of this air actually contacts the surface of the tubes. Um, and that's why the bypass factor, that, that's an indication of, uh, okay, well, what fraction of this air actually does come into contact with the tubes? It only takes a small amount, uh, but it's not, you know, 100%. Um, yeah, so then uh, the chilled air comes out, the uh, refrigerant takes away the heat, and then some energy goes out with the water. Yes, sir? I did want to ask for, you were mentioning the, the apparatus dew point temperature. Mm -hmm. So if there's a bypass factor like the, the previous problem of 0.2, does that mean 20% of the air is contacting the coil and the other 80% is flowing past it but not contacting that's right. it? That, that's what it means. Yes, okay. it means that uh, in theory, okay, uh, uh, um, what it's saying is that the, the effect, the effect of, of all of this is that 20% of the air, we're saying 20% of the air touches the tubes and 80% does not. It just passes. It just passes right through. Okay. Yeah. But the net effect is the cooling that we see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's just a kind of a simplification. Yes? Where does the water go? Uh, where, where do you want it to go? <laughs> <laughs> in my house, it just, just goes curious. out and dumps in the backyard. <laughs> but in a, uh, in a big building, um, well, if you're doing net zero, Oh, you know, that reminds me, we've got to do the, I have to try to set up a tour of the, of the Bullock Center in Seattle. That building is amazing because it's, it's just totally, you know, it makes its own energy. It, it doesn't emit any CO2 and uh, it, it reuses its own wastes. And so it, it recycles, you can recycle this and use it as gray, gray water or with some treatment, yeah, maybe drinking water. I, I'm not really sure what, what happens. In, in a lot of a lot of cases, but uh, it is clean, and it can be used for uh, for for, for uh, you know, it's gray water for gardening or uh, you know, at the very least. But I'm afraid in a lot of situations, it's just dumped to the environment. That's a, be a good project for. Uh, project is to find out what what, what what can we do with this water. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, an ideal vapor compression cycle, if you want to see an example, this is just uh, a kind of a problem we would do in thermo. So, you know, there's a link there to review. Might be helpful for the FE exam, but uh, I'm not going to do this. Let's see, do I have a link in the note? In my note? Did I, uh... Was that? Yeah, I think... That we're going to your minus 20 and 120. I think the problems might be different. Anyway, I'll, I'll post these um, separately. This might be a different... Yeah, it's a different example. U U Y J W. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that that one's not in my notes, but the next one is because this is the actual uh, vapor compression cycle. So the actual cycle is going to be different because entropy is generated in the compressor. It's not isentropic. So the, see, go, we go off to the right to point two instead of two s. 
Also, the vapor entering the compressor is going to be slightly superheated. So you see we go out to the right, slightly superheated. And this is to protect the compressor. We don't want any liquid droplets in the compressor. So this buys us a little bit of assurance that going into the compressor, we have all vapor and no, no liquid stuff. Um, also, this, uh, you know, to, to, the, the more superheated this is, the less work the compressor has to do to superheat. Um, so it, it helps to reduce the energy consumption. Um, it, create, it allows the uh, refrigerant to absorb more heat um, because it, the, the, the heating, the, 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 uh, the refrigerant can continue to absorb uh, energy from the space that we're cooling a little bit longer. Um, and then it reduces the mass flow rate through the compressor. Um, and uh, then the liquid leaving the condenser is slightly subcooled. Now the way, a way that you can achieve this uh, simultaneously is you bring these two streams into contact. You bring the, the condensate outlet. So if you come out, it's, you come out superheated liquid, uh, you come out as uh, saturated liquid, and then you, you run this tube of refrigerant, you actually run it beside the, the tube coming out of the evaporator. You, 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 you allow them to physically contact each other. And what happens is heat moves from, because this is hot, heat transfers from the hot condensate to the vapor coming off the evaporator, resulting in superheating of the vapor and subcooling of the liquid. So that's one way this is done. By putting the tubes side by side and then wrapping common insulation around them, not binding them together. Um, so this gives you, uh, it increases the refrigeration effect because it means instead of coming out at four prime, now you're going to come out to the left, so you're going to have more liquid. So a greater refrigeration effect, and uh, the temperature, yeah, okay. So, um, and then the other thing that's different about uh, the, the actual is that the refrigerant temperature and the space temperature are different. The refrigerant has to be colder in order to transfer heat from space you're cooling into the refrigerant. The ideal, remember the ideal cycle, uh, the process uh, is going to be, uh, your processes are reversible. Reversible heat transfer is heat transfer with no temperature difference. So TL and the refrigerant temperature will be the same in the ideal case. But of course, if they're the same temperature, it's not going to be heat transfer, or it's going to be very little. If there's an incremental difference, so the bigger that gap, the, the more effective the heat transfer will be, but the less efficient the cycle will be. Generally, you want something like 10 to 15 degrees difference between the space you're cooling and the refrigerant and the evaporator to get good heat transfer. And the same thing on the condenser side, in order to, uh, to reject heat from the refrigerant, the condenser temperature has to be higher than the surrounding temperature. So you've got to have a gap there to drive the heat transfer out of the system. And that effect, see so you're actually moving TH and TL closer together, uh, that reduces the efficiency, reduces the COP of the, of the system. Um, something like five to 10 degrees Celsius. Um, and then, uh, we want to represent refrigeration on the pH diagram. And that's what we're gonna, we're gonna do with this uh, second problem here, the second part of the problem. Now, I actually have an example here where I do this for R134A. Well, let's just show what's going on here. The uh, evaporator uh, process is happening at low pressure. So you have pressure here, so the low pressure side, we evaporate from a saturated mixture to around saturated vapor, a little bit of superheat, condensing constant pressure on the high pressure end from the superheated vapor state. So we desuperheat, 
to saturation. These are temperature lines here. So you can see at this point we're at like 160, 170 degrees. Then we're desuperheating down to saturation, which is about 80 degrees. And then constant temperature, 80 degrees, constant pressure to liquid. And then we're, we, go uh, we go down. So there's our, 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 our compressor. Our compressor is, uh, our isotropic process happens at constant entropy. These are lines of constant entropy. So we just follow parallel, we go parallel to, or on a constant entropy line until we get to the desired pressure, the outlet pressure. And that would be our point two S. And then our actual outlet state will be determined by the isentropic efficiency of the compressor. That's going to take us to the right. So higher entropy, also higher temperature coming off the compressor. And then we go, uh, we go directly to the left to uh, condense and then throttling down to this point here, point four, and then the cycle begins again. And then I have an example that shows how to do this. I think this is the example that's in the uh, notes here, minus 20. Yeah, so this is the example. If you, if you read the notes, there's a link to the YouTube video, and you can watch me work this problem. But I'm not going to do this here because you can watch me do this uh, on the video, but I want to do the problem that's in front of you, which follows the same process. Okay? Well, let's take a break because we're well past the midpoint. And my uh, voice is fading. <laughs> Let's design the refrigeration process for our car air conditioner. So here's what we have. We've determined that we need 25,321 BT per hour of cooling, total cooling. So that is going to be absorbed by our refrigerant in the evaporator. So that's our QL, 25,341 BT per hour. Uh, and then we're given uh, some, some properties of the, of the refrigeration process. We are um, we're, we're going to condense at 110 degrees. That's our condensing temperature. And then we're going to run our evaporator at 40 PSI. Um, we're going to come out of our evaporator not as saturated vapor, but with 15 degrees of superheat. And that means that we're, uh, the temperature coming out is going to be the saturation temperature at 40 psi plus 15 degrees. Okay. Um, and then for our condenser, we're going to come out not as saturated liquid as we would on the ideal con condenser, but as subcool, which means the saturation temperature minus 20. 20 degrees below the saturation temperature. The saturation temperature is, is, is 110 because that's, good. that's the temperature of uh, phase change. So this is going to be 90 degrees here. Um, and we'll have to figure out from the chart what the temperature is there. Um, and then the other thing we're, we're told is that the compressor is, has an isentropic efficiency of 70%. So that is the ratio of the ideal work over the actual work. Okay, so it comes within 70% of being you know, ideal. Um, and that's also equal to H2S minus H1 over H2 actual minus H1. Okay? And what we want to do is we want to find the COP and the required mass flow rate of the refrigerant, which is this uh, the end here. Um, COP is uh, QL over W, which we could also express as H1 minus H4 over H2 minus H1. 
one because these are energy balances around the devices. QL is an energy balance around the evaporator. So H1 minus H4, that's equal to the heat going in. And then the work is going to be, the work is going to the compressor H2 minus H1. Okay. So our challenge is to find out what uh, the values of H are values of H. And for our mass flow rate of the refrigerant, we're going to get that from an energy balance around the evaporator. So what does that look like? If we do a rate balance around the evaporator, Refrigerant, enthalpy at four plus QL, and that's going to be the mass flow rate leaving times the enthalpy at one. So that's our energy balance, rate balance around the evaporator. And if we solve that for mass flow rate, which is what we're looking for, let's see, we've got uh, M uh, H. That's our mass flow rate. So we just have to find out these enthalpies H1, H2, and H4 at least. And because this is a throttling process, H3 equals H4 throttle. Okay? Yes, sir. I did want to ask for when it's uh, isenthalpic, that's both for the real case and then for the ideal, correct? Yeah. Uh, when we, yes. When we well, look the up ideal properties. is roughly. Okay. Yeah. Nothing is ever perfect. But it's close it's, enough where we can yeah. use the charts that way. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay. So here's our, our, um, our diagram, our pH diagram. Uh, so how do we approach this? Well, um, to me, the easiest thing to do first is to set the maximum and minimum pressures. The maximum pressure will be at the condenser, the minimum pressure at the evaporator. We're given the minimum pre uh, we're given the evaporator pressure, so that's an easy one. That's going to set the bottom. So our bottom, our low pressure end is right there at 40. We can just draw a horizontal line all the way across, and that's going to be the base of our trapezoid, our trapezoidal type diagram. And then at the top, we're at 110 degrees. So I have to come over and look for a temperature of 110. Well, I see 100 and 120. And you see the temperature lines follow. Um, so here's, here's 100 degrees. And you follow that line, and it kind of curves up to the left, hits the saturation curve, and then it's horizontal. For the phase change, we get the condensed liquid, and it's almost vertical up. So all the temperature lines go that way. Now, if we're looking for, uh, we're 110 degrees in the condenser, that means we're going to be right in between the 100 and 120. So our, um, our condenser is going to be operating right there. And then the pressure, to get that pressure, we just read over to the pressure to the vertical, and it's about, what, 180 or something like that? But I'm just eyeballing it here. I'm going to go to another diagram where I filled it in. So here's what it looks like. Okay, so 
I start where, you know, pre I, I like working with pressure because it's on the vertical. To me, that's the easiest thing to set at the beginning. So I, I start with 40 PSI and I make a horizontal line and that's gonna be my, my evaporator's gonna operate at 40 PSI. Okay, now let's go to state one. Coming out of the evaporator, I'm gonna be at TSAT plus 15, plus 15. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here to saturation. The saturation temperature looks like it's about 25 degrees. That's hard to read, so uh, if you flip this over, you'll find a table, a saturation table, that will allow us to be a little more exact for the saturated states. So if I go to 40 PSI, you look at the second column, is it 20, about 25? and you see 40.062 for pressure, and it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's going to be my sat, my uh, my T sat at one, or T sat. Um, I think call this the. Uh, this this is the t temperature in the evaporator. It is twenty five degrees. And my design state specification is I come out with fifteen degrees of superheat. So that means T one is going to be 25 degrees plus 15 equals 40 degrees F, okay? That's my 15 degrees of superheat. So I have, I'm, I'm at 25 degrees there, and I add 15 to get to 40. Here's 40 degrees. I think that's negative 40. Oops, that's uh, 40. So here's 40. So it hits right there, and then it comes almost straight down, and it intersects 40 PSI right there, right? So that's where I, I put my point one, state one. It's TSAT plus 15, and it brings us to 40 degrees, which is that isotherm there. Okay, you see how we did that? Okay, so I've established my state one. Now I have an isentropic compression. I'm gonna assume initially that my compressor is isentropic, so I'm gonna do an isentropic compression to the condenser pressure. Now what's the condenser pressure? Well, I know it's 110 degrees, and I know that condensing, you know, it's gonna happen at saturation, a saturated state. So it's going to be at whatever the saturation pressure is corresponding to 110 degrees. So, you know, I drew that 110 degree line and that pressure is just going to be the pressure that I read off on the left side here. And again, to get exact, I go to the back page. Let's see. Um, if we're at 110 degrees, so if I go to 110 degrees, it's going to be close to 85 degrees, right? It's about 84. Oh, wait a second. No, I'm, I'm reading this wrong. What am, what am I doing wrong? I think if you go to temperature for 110. Yeah, temperature is 110. Pressure. Yeah, I believe. Oh, okay. So the pressure, I go to 110 degrees, and the pressure is about 160, 161. Not, not that I need to know that, but I just just to be able to, to have to have to make my 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 graph complete. Um, okay, but all I really need to know is I just need to establish that 110 degree line right there, and and that's what I'm going to be moving across. And uh, that condenser, everything from two to three happens at constant pressure, so I'm going to stay on that same horizontal line. All right, so I'm going to do an isotropic compression from one until I hit the red line. 
So isotropic means I follow a line of constant entropy. These are constant entropy lines right here. The number doesn't matter. All we want to do is go parallel. It's, always, it's nice if, if our point falls right on one of those lines. It's easy. But in this case, we're actually in between. Here's an entropy of 0 0.20 right there. And this entropy line is 0.19. So we're somewhere between 0.19 and 0.2. So I want to try as best as possible to go, stri uh, to go up parallel to these lines. Now, it's hard because these lines get wider a little bit. They move wider, further apart as you go up. So trying to stay at the same value is kind of hard, but did the best I could, see, going parallel and staying exactly in between, trying to stay in between those two, takes me up to 2s, okay? See how we did that? If you wanted to be more exact, you could get the uh, property tables and do an interpolation. But it's just not necessary with this kind of a design. This is a forgiving design process. We don't need to be exact. Plus, we'd have to go find superheat tables. We don't have one. We only have saturation here. Um, but anyway, so now we're at 2s. And we want the enthalpies. That's, that's really what we're after. Enthalpy is on the horizontal line here. So what I do is I draw a straight vertical line connecting you know, the enthalpy at the bottom, and it's also repeated at the top. Just make sure this lines up, because I don't, maybe it's exactly vertical, I'm not sure, but I want to be careful here. And read off the enthalpies. Again, it's hard to be exact, but just do the best we can. I can't really see if this is going to pull us down a little bit. So the first point's on about 105, correct? Yes. So T1, uh, the enthalpy the of 1 yeah. is about. Well, the enthalpy at 1 is about 94. It's just to the left of the 95. So you've got little dashed lines. This goes by increments of 5 units. So 80, 85, 90, 95, 100. It might be 93. 93, 94, I think, for 1. And then 2s is right on the 105. That's, a, that's an easy one because it falls right on the line there. So that's 105. Now, how do I get the actual? Two, the actual enthalpy at two, well, I use my isentropic efficiency and I solve for H2. Okay? You remember this from Thermo? Probably, maybe you remember. It might come back. So um, this is going to give me H2. So solving for H2, we get. H2 equals H2S minus H1 over the isentropic efficiency, right? So that's just solve, solving this for H. H2. So if I plug in the numbers, H2S was. over 0.7 and we get one ten. Okay? So then I come back over here and now what I have to do is Find 110 on the enthalpy scale, which is right there, 
Oh, uh, Dr. Hmm? You'd have to add H1 to that answer. It would be, I think, plus H1. Oh, it only I forgot gives, the... Uh, it only gives 15.7, uh, but that part just gives 15.7. Oh, sorry 7. about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just wanted to... So then I come over here and I, I draw a vertical line. I, I, I locate 110, h equals 110. So h2 is 110. And I draw a line, vertical line, and see where it intersects my pressure line here, the red horizontal line, and it intersects right there. And that's going to be my actual. state two. So uh, I got a lot of lines here, but my actual process would be from one to two. So there's my compressor. All right, now if we, uh, we de superheat from two to saturation, so we're going to drop in temperature. Looks like uh, T2 is right on the 140. So we're going to cool from 140 to saturation, which is 110. So once we're at 110, we begin to condense the refrigerant, and we go all the way until we get to state three, subcooled liquid state, and then we can get the enthalpy there by drawing a straight line to the horizontal and reading off our enthalpy very convenient, it lines up right at 40. And H4 equals H3, so that's handy. And that brings us to a quality of about 0 0.3, 0 0.28 maybe? It's 0 0.2, 0 0.3, so about 0 0.28, 0 0.29. Close to 0 0.3, which is about where we would want, we would expect to see the quality going into our uh, our evaporator. Okay, so if we now complete our diagram here. So two to three and three to four, and then four to one. see that here we're at, uh, th this is 25 degrees. And we're trying to cool air. What is our, T, uh, our TL? 40, uh, 47? temperature coming out of the cooling coil is 47 degrees mm -hmm. is what we're shooting for. So we've got our air. Our air is sitting on uh, tubes that are carrying refrigerant at 25 degrees. So we're transferring energy from 47 down to 25 when we're coming, you know, at the tail end of the, of the uh, cooling coil. But anyway, that's our that's our cycle, and uh, so now we're, yeah, we can calculate everything that we're looking for here. So, 
Uh, let's see, we were looking for the mass flow rate. So the mass flow rate is 25,341 BTU per hour divided by H1, which is 94, minus H4, which is 40, BTU per pound, and uh, let's get this into minutes. So M is what we get 7.8. Okay, so my refrigerant has to move, my, my refrigeration cycle has to move refrigerant at 7.8 pounds per minute and then our COP, QL over W, well, let's see. Um, we can just use our enthalpies here. So our H2, what happened here? I lost, uh, lost my... I lost it, but I'll just take it off. So H2 was... Uh, what happened. I just uh, went page down there. Mm -hmm. our, um, so, Dr. Paul? Yes. I did want to ask a, more of a conceptual question. Mm -hmm. So, essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, problem one is the HVAC calculations that you would do, and problem two is taking that information and writing it in, or essentially converting it to a manner where you can determine not only flow rate, but COP so you could actually specify equipment, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is that COP flipped over there? Hmm? Is that COP is, yeah, H2O minus H1 over H1 minus H4. Shouldn't that be the other way around? Oh. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm just flip, flip. better? Yes. Now it's different. the number. No, I think it's uh, 3.375. About 3 point, yeah, exactly 3.375 should be. Is that? It's about, th it's exactly 3.375. 
it's pretty rare to see COP numbers uh, written in more than more decimal places than that. Um, tenths is, is about the best one. Um, Thanks, question. Okay. Anyway, um, this. We're gonna watch the video. This presentation. You know, after the example, um, it talks about refrigerants, and, and this is uh, again, this is review of uh, really review of the, the thermo class. Where we we talked about the different refrigerants. Oh yeah, I think you mentioned. The, I think you did talk about. That. We're trying to find. Uh, strike a, a, a balance between performance, safety, reliability, and uh, environmental impact. And uh, if we look at the refrigerants, we classify them into synthetic versus natural. Um, synthetics are the ones that are made, of course, human made. And uh, the first ones were made in the 1920s, and it was considered a great triumph of engineering, science and engineering, because it really allowed for rapid expansion of, of air conditioning and refrigeration when CFCs were developed and then these others came a little later. Before that we had ammonia um, and then and more recently carbon dioxide and propane. Um, those are the big three the natural refrigerants. Um, and then uh, characteristics, there's a number, there's actually a scheme to the numbering that relates to the chemical structure um, and some other aspects of and, uh, and then you can see um, R134A. Uh, these are the ones that were damaging to the ozone that contain chlorine. And they've been largely replaced by uh, hydrofluorocarbons, which just have hydrogen fluorine and carbon. But fluorine has issues as well. Um, so we're trying to get away from compounds that contain uh, uh, fluoride, but this is the global warming potential. This number is relative to carbon dioxide. If carbon dioxide is one, this is the impact relative to CO2 of you know, one pound of refrigerant in the atmosphere. And you can see R134A very high and R410 even higher. Those are the two workhorses. <laughs> They're trying to get away. One, two, three, four, five F is just four. And uh, that's why this one's being considered for, uh, for automobiles in particular. There's actually some new ones that have come on that are pretty good. Uh, ammonia zero, and, and these others are, are pretty low. But they have problems of flammability, you know, or toxicity, or both. Um, and uh, so you know, if you look at them, these are phased out. Um, R22 phased out. And new equipment, so 2010 was when we stopped using R22, but I think you might st still be able to get a hold of it, but probably not. I think in 2022 it might have been. Not, maybe this year, or very recently, you can't even get this for replacement anymore. Um, and then these are the ones that are going to be going away in the next 10 years or so. And uh, still a lot of questions about where we're going. You know, with new with new refrigerants, this is wide open. Um, yeah. So uh, heat pumps are, of course, the big thing now, uh, but they're really no different than uh, than an air conditioner. It's just an air conditioner. The difference is that the heat pump has uh, modern heat pumps have technology that allows you to switch a condenser to evaporator and evaporator to condenser. In other words. To, to turn my air conditioner into a heater, I don't physically have to remove the condenser and move it outdoors and bring the evaporator or, or to go from heating to cooling. I don't have to bring the evaporator in from outdoors and put the condenser outside. They stay in the same place, but you switch the direction of the refrigerant flow. This is the key technology, is um, when, the, when the fluid moves one way, this acts as a condenser. When you turn it around and move it the other way, it acts as an evaporator. And um, that device, this is what it looks like. 
This is called a reversing valve. It's part of what makes heat pumps expensive, you know, more expensive than uh, you know, just a regular air conditioner. So here we have the evaporator outside, the condenser inside for heating, and then we go to cooling, we can switch the flow. And the condenser's outside and the evaporator's uh, inside. And it's this little reversing valve here. It's just really quite an intricate little device. And it works uh, off of the temperature. You can do it manually or it can, it can be set up to do automatically with seasonal change. And uh, then there's, okay, most of the, the vast majority of HVAC that I think we would have ever seen would be vapor compression applications. But there are some um, more uh, boutique kinds of applications that use other cycles, and we'll talk a little bit about those on uh, Wednesday, you know, for like commercial aircraft, and when you have very big refrigeration needs, there are other cycles that work better than vapor compression. And I'm going to close this out by just looking at how different HVAC systems are configured with their refrigeration units and their air handling units. And then actually today was scheduled, we're scheduled to talk about uh, air quality in, in, in the indoor environment. That's actually a pretty brief uh, unit, so it's, it's only gonna take us a few minutes, I think, to talk about that. So you know, looking at what is comfort, how do we know what comfort is, and uh, looking at how much energy people give off when they're doing various things. And I've already posted the notes for that, so you can, uh, but I have a presentation to go along with it when I do that Wednesday. Yeah, so can I collect your, uh, your, your classwork? Which can just be anything to document